This is the puzzle of conditions where crime and the disordered mind are related. We're concerned here with the psychopath, the man without a conscience. He is of the gravest concern to criminologists and to psychiatrists, all those interested in antisocial behavior. If a man can't distinguish between right and wrong, is he sick and ought he to be in a mental hospital? Or is he a criminal and should he be locked up in jail? These are the questions that come up time and time again in this case. This man has served a term in the penitentiary. He has been in a psychiatric ward. The police know him as a convicted burglar. The psychiatrists call him a psychopathic personality. This is the psychiatrist, Dr. Henry de Ross, who has worked with the puzzle of this man. Does it ever bother you when you do something wrong? Well, I'd never regret it before. I'd only regret it afterwards, particularly if I was caught. This is Bob Bota's store and postal station that he broke into. The inspectors were notified and uh, from the postal authorities when they came in and we went through the invent inventories, we discovered that over $1,700 worth of stamps were missing. This is Detective Sergeant McKenzie who arrested him. And I, I find him, in my experience, he was a very strange chap and uh, a very smart man with actually non-existent accounts. This is the Federal Training Center, where under Deputy Warden Laferriere. No, no, never, never. He was never a disciplinary problem. This is the building where he reported to his probation officer, Bill Connell. I've lost track of the number of jobs I got for him. Maybe 15 different jobs. And the question comes, where does he, where does society go next? What do you think the chances are of your getting into further trouble? like you have up to now. Serious trouble? No. Do you agree, Dr. Dross, that his chances of getting into serious trouble are nil? I'm afraid I don't. Both in my experience with this particular patient and in general, in fact, it's almost inevitable. Why? In, well, the psychopath is characteristically an individual who just is unable to follow a plan of action through to its logical conclusion. They are basically irresponsible people while being at the same time intelligent and manifesting all kinds of innate capabilities. They don't seem to be able to sustain this. They're, they're subject to their whims, their frustration tolerance is low. If they want to do something, they do it on the moment with little or no regard for the consequences, either for themselves and unfortunately for other people. What made him this way? Well, I suspect that many of these people in their early childhood did not have the opportunity to form really satisfying relationships with their parents and with other people. And they grow up with some kind of innate incapacity to establish meaningful relationships with other people so that when they disappoint others, as they repeatedly do, it just has no impression on them. Let us now look at some of the things this man has done. How far back do you date this difficulty of, what well, you call it, being wild? Well, the time I was about 10. 10. What happened then? Well, I saw some older boys smoking, and I decided to try it. Mm -hmm. So I always hung out with a crowd that was several years older than me. I never hung out with anyone my own age. Mm -hmm. I was always older. Did and of course, any? to be accepted, well, I had to be just a little bit more daring than them. Mm -hmm. Did you get into any serious trouble at that age? No, not until I was about 16. 16? Yes. What happened then? Well, I always wandered around town with a gun. Even then you started carrying guns? Oh, yes. I think you've always had an interest in them. Well, I know what they're capable of doing, and I... I and bit of an expert on them. They've always appealed to me because uh, they give a sense of power. And I like power. I like to be able to control others. I usually always carry them, too. It wasn't because I wanted to uh, use them. I mean, I, I imagine I'd be capable, but I, at the time, I didn't want to use one as a hold-up or uh, killing or anything like that. No. It's, what is the most serious thing that you've done that you've been caught for? Well, the post office. The post office? Mm. What well, was involved there? Well, I went into the place and I made a withdrawal at night. <laughs> <laughs>
the man came in uh, through the through the through the open transom down the, the step ladders here, and uh, went over into the post office, which was uh, substation number one at that time. All the drawers been uh, forced, and the contents all over the place. And of course, we could not touch it until the postal authorities were notified, and uh, the inspectors were there in no time. How did it come to light that you had you had done it? Somebody goofed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I talked to on you? Well, I talked too much. It was my own fault. Mm -hmm. I started bragging about it because uh, when you do something like that, and, and if you've got no nobody to tell it to, I mean, it sort of takes the uh, takes the edge off. The edge off it. Mm -hmm. So I told it to the wrong people, and uh, that a p particular person uh, got caught for something else, and to try and get pressure off him, he turned around, and turned me in, and then for me to get pressure off off of me, I turned the others in. This car is driven by Detective Sergeant Gordon McKenzie, who investigated the case. He led us to a gang of uh, well-known receivers who had a house in the eastern part of the city where we succeeded in recovering some of the stolen stamps. And um, after that, uh, in a search in a downtown house, uh, he asked me for a loan of my revolver uh, to be the first one up the stairs, which I thought was very strange. And I told him at the time that he'd better leave that work to us. The director of the rehabilitation service is Frank Roberts. He committed a pretty serious crime for breaking and answering and theft. But the judge didn't want to saddle the man with a jail sentence. He asked us, asked our representative in court, if we could study the case and see what we could recommend. Our representative, Mr. Connell, brought the young man to our office. We had a long discussion with him. We found him various jobs. And then we realized that because of the man's unfortunate past, a very unsatisfactory childhood, no guidance in his adult years, we decided that he was a medical problem, and not a social problem. We then called in a lot of community resources doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, the Verdun Hospital, Carl Memorial Hospital, um, the Royal Victoria Hospital, social workers in other fields, and we attempted to solve this boy's mental problem. This is Verdun Protestant Hospital. Their records quote this man as saying, I have no morals, no scruples, no emotions, no particular feeling for anybody. The record says, a year ago I saw a psychiatrist, but there was a difference of opinion. He told me I was crazy. I thought he was. The reasons why I actually came to the hospital was because of that uh, suicide attempt there. That was one of the main reasons. Suicide attempt? Well, uh, when I took the pills and went to the Raw Vic and uh, my stomach pumped out. And tried to shoot the doctor in the bargain. Well, let's take that one thing at a time. Do you remember <coughs> why you took the pills? Uh, yes, I, I didn't want to appear in court. I was supposed to, I was scheduled to appear in court a couple of days later and I, I wasn't looking forward to it. Did you take enough that you was any real risk of dying? I didn't think so. It didn't really occur to you that there was any possibility of dying? Well, no, because I didn't intend to die. Although I might have because I, it's hard to judge uh, the quantity and what it'll do to you. You mentioned something about trying to shoot the doctor? Yes, well, when he was pumping my stomach out, I mean, I didn't care for that too much because he was ruining my my scheme. So I tried to shoot him. Your scheme? Well, yes, because I, I wanted it to, to take its natural course. See, but I don't quite see how getting your stomach pumped out would change that. Did you feel they'd just pump you out and then send you home? Yes. You still have to go to court. That's right. I see. <clears throat> and you went to the hospital after that? To, uh, you were done, yes. Mm -hmm. I think I remember you calling me one time and you told me that you were in a telephone booth and it was practically literally full of blood. Yes, I know. There wasn't any. Was this part of your histrionic? Yes, because I, I had the pain in the stomach and uh, whenever I had a pain, I always thought, well, this is it. You and were I've in a real panic, though, then. I think yes, I've always been afraid of something happening to your stomach. Well, I've always had a mortal fear of, a, of a, an internal hemorrhage. I don't know why. Probably because it's fatal. So that you've been afraid of dying because of something bad happening inside of you? Yes. 
But I, uh, it's not the death itself, it's the manner of dying that I was always afraid of. What do you mean? Well, uh, I like, uh, I've always liked to be dramatic, and uh, under cer certain circumstances, I wouldn't object to dying, provided it was all set up according to the way I liked it. I think I recall your telling me when I was treating you before that if you died, this would have rather unpleasant consequences for me. Yes, yes, because uh, at the time you didn't believe that there was anything wrong inside. Mm -hmm. But I didn't believe you. And uh, I told, I had told you as a threat to a certain extent that uh, if I went, well, that you'd be joining me very shortly. How were you going to arrange that? Oh, there's a lot of people in town that would would have done it. But of course, I never did do it. I never made the arrangement. It was a bluff. You told me that you had arranged to have me killed, and I think that the doctor had treated you at another hospital. Yes. But that, that was a bluff. But of course, the only way for me to call it was for her to drop dead. You have gotten involved, though, in some pretty complicated prevarications. Yes, uh, I seem to uh, go in for the complicated ones rather than simple ones. I remember an incident here at the hospital when you collected a lot of money for an entertainment and you took off for a weekend without permission and took the money with you and spent it. Yes. And do you remember what your feelings were when you came back and had to face the people that I was given you the money? I was very embarrassed. It isn't associated with any feeling yourself that you've done something wrong? Well, sometimes if it's uh, against an individual, I'll feel sorry for it and I'll regret doing it. But if it's against a, a group, uh, it doesn't bother me. Well, this young man certainly gives the impression of understanding his inner workings. Uh, how much of this is true? Well, I agree. One would think that he has really deep insight into what he's doing and the causes for it and the need to correct this kind of behavior in the future. But if you follow this kind of person along, you find that this insight that seems so deep actually doesn't penetrate below the surface at all. It's as if they are using words that have, have no meaning to them in, in any way. But it must be very persuasive on first contact. I'm afraid it is. They, they're very persuasive people. They're often quite charming and engaging, and they are quite capable of en enlisting the help of a lot of well-meaning people who try very hard to help them realize they've gotten into a lot of difficulty, seem somehow to sense that their difficulties are on the basis of something emotionally wrong with them, rather than simply criminal behavior, for example. But I'm afraid in most instances their efforts are generally to no avail at all. What he seems just an irresponsible person. Well, irresponsible in a sense, but if one looks over <coughs> from a long-range point of view, what he's done over the past few years, it amounts to more than simple irresponsibility. He has all kinds of golden opportunities to do something for himself, and he blows them every time. And, and gets into criminal activity? What's the difference between him and any other criminal? Well, in this patient, the criminal activity seems to be purely on impulse. It doesn't seem to have any good reason for it. The, the, the so-called normal criminal robs a bank for the $10,000 that he gets out of it and for what it will buy him. The psychopath robs not so much for the joy of stealing as the kleptomaniac does, but simply because he wants something right now and he goes and gets it and takes it, regardless of the consequences. Were well, you implying then that he's a sick person? Yes, I would certainly say that he's sick. I think it's difficult meeting him, say, in the courtroom or in the psychiatrist's office to say that he's sick. He seems to behave perfectly well. He thinks clearly, seems to understand what he's doing, what he has done, and what he should do. But the moment he leaves, he does quite the opposite, and one has to look at him from a longitudinal point of view and see that an individual with all his capacities has simply failed over and over again for no adequate reasons. Well, can you cure him? Cure him? I doubt it. I don't think that this man really is susceptible to successful treatment. I think it's really more a question of protecting the community from his damaging activities. Is this because Skadri doesn't know enough, or because it's just Impossible. Well, perhaps a bit of both. I think, as far as the second part of your question is concerned, that these people probably, because of damaging experiences in their childhood or some genetic factor that they inherit, 
are unable to relate and therefore unable to use treatment. There's nothing to work with. They, they're like, we'll say the cerebral palsy child who has a physical disability that he is unable to walk correctly for the rest of his life. And that has happened in, in childhood and one can't change it. These people have some kind of emotional instability disorder that probably developed in their early childhood and remains a more or less fixed thing. Well, then is he responsible for what he does? Very difficult problem <clears throat> in the court because he's obviously competent, certainly not insane, then he's generally held responsible for what he does. What happens is that most judges are so impressed by the obviously pathological history lying behind the individual crime for which he may be appearing to recognize that this man isn't the ordinary run-of-the-mill criminal, often refers him to a psychiatrist or a psychiatric unit for treatment. And they can't do anything about him? And they very often fail, discharge him back into the community. All too often, he simply carries on where he left off. So he may go back and forth between the judicial authorities and the psychiatric authorities in the, in the, in the hospital sense, without anything really being done. Let's pick up the story again at the Catholic Rehabilitation Center with Frank Roberts. Eventually, after he'd been out on probation for maybe eight, ten months, we couldn't get any further with him. He would accept employment, almost any type of employment. He considered it beneath him, but he would accept it, and for various reasons, he threw it up after a very short time. We, re we had various discussions with him over quite a period of time on probation. We told him he wasn't adjusting, that we'd have to give a bad report to the judge and that he might have to be sent to the penitentiary. Eventually, when he knew we were giving a bad report to the judge, he accepted his sentence. He was sent to the penitentiary. From there, he was transferred to the Federal Training Center. He adjusted uh, pretty well, except for the fact that he wanted to, to reorganize the institution. This is the Federal Training Center where promising young offenders sentenced to penitentiary serve out their sentences while being retrained for life in society. It's very different from the maximum security penitentiary next door. Our subject was transferred here. This is Deputy Warden Robert Laferriere. And how was he as prisoner? Well, in a few words, it's pretty hard to say, but uh, I'll try to tell you uh, this much. At first, it was pretty hard for him to get adapted to the institution. And then, uh, uh, very active in uh, wanting to write and to uh, improve his education all the time. He read a great deal, did uh, he? A great deal. But of course, he had this mania about the uh, military history and strategy. What about that? Uh, well, it was not unpleasant to, to hear him talk about it, but it was, uh, you had to, uh, to allow an awful lot of free time to uh, to, to hear his story there, because it was endless, actually. There was no end to him talking about that particular subject. But you enjoyed talking to him. Oh, yes, time. oh, yes. He was very, uh, he was a likable fellow. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I I used to even take some short walks inside the institution with him. But he uh, used to start many things, but he had to be pushed a bit to finish them or keep up with them. Uh, there was a tendency uh, with him to start an awful lot of things and even to think of many things. Like, uh, for instance, uh, when he had problems, he used to make suggestions for the, to improve the lot of all the inmates in the institution. But at the, if you study the case closer, you would find that it was his problem that was being uh, exposed there. This, I suppose, became more clear when it came time for him to leave. Yes, towards the end of his sentence, uh, uh, anxiety was uh, more evident, and uh, he required more attention, more interviews. Of course, this is where our friend Mr. Connell came in and gave us a hand there. Bill Connell was our man's probation officer. A uh, short while ago, he came out of the penitentiary and was again placed under our supervision. He told me that he had wrote an article while in the penitentiary, and I read it, read part of it, and then I turned it over to Mr. Levison of the Montreal Gazette, who read this article, and uh, he expressed an opinion to me, if the boy wrote this, why, he had a future as a writer. I was amazed with what I read. 
It was a long 10 or 15,000 word article on international affairs and particularly on efforts to affect world peace and it contained proposals uh, for improving the situation. I realized that it wouldn't be beyond possibility that he was showing this work as his own, as some kind of con, a work that he had copied from somebody else. So I asked to see the young man and had lunch with him. And during lunch hour, I asked him to list his bibliography for this article. He floored me with the most formidable list of standard texts on the whole subject that one could ever want to hear. And in further conversation with him, I was firmly convinced that he had read all these books, not only read them, but fully understood them. He also showed me some other literary works on a variety of subjects, and they all had great literary merit. And I'm convinced that this boy has great possibilities in the writing field. Mr. Levison and I talked about this for some time, and we decided if this boy could get a job out of town, up north somewhere, where he would have a lot of free evenings where he could study in, in his writing career. So we brought this up with this young fella, and he said, well, that's all right, I'm willing to go up north. We sent him up north. He didn't stay there for any length of time. He was right back in Montreal. He was supposed to go back on the job. He never went. Now, he's no longer under our supervision. His ticket of leave has expired. And I understand now he's working in some nightclub as a busboy. Well, a whole area of promise exploded. Since then, he's been creating undercover gossip for what he calls a scandal sheet. Garbage, he calls it. You have been doing some writing lately, I gather. Garbage. Garbage? Well, for a uh, scandal sheet. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing it? <clears throat> well, because I know the city. I know what's going on in the city. Why? What happens when you get in a job and you, you start to lose interest in it? I just don't show up. I, I don't you often... You just quit? Well, I don't even formally quit. I just don't come back. Have you any idea what lies behind this tendency of yours to lose interest so quickly in things? Well, once I, I, I understand what the job is all about, and I can do it, well, I don't want to do it anymore. I get tired of it. Because I don't like the routine, daily, the same repetitious sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What about, what are your long-range plans? Well, sometimes I have them, but uh, I think more of the present than of the future. I mean, like everyone, everyone else, I'd like to settle down, get married, and raise a family, but I probably won't. Why do you think you won't? Oh, well, I mean, I'd have to give up a, a heck of a lot. And at the present time, I, I don't think I could. What are you giving up? My freedom, which is very important to me. Because uh, the ability to do what I want, when I want, would also mean I'd have to assume responsibility. And I'd be tied to a certain place with certain people. And uh, a lot of things would be expected of me. Now, whether or not I'd do them, I don't know. I'd try to buy affection rather than because it's cheaper. I don't have to give anything. I don't have to give myself. I don't make friends easily anyway. Why is that so? I never particularly wanted them. Well, I wanted them, yes, but uh, I never trusted them enough. I never wanted them to get too close to me so that they would get to know me. <coughs> what, what is this fear of people getting too close to you? Well, I'd lose an advantage. I always look for that. I, I very seldom give anyone an advantage. I always try to keep it for myself. Sort of a, a one-upmanship? Yes. All the time? Never give a sucker an even break sort of thing, you know? But the interesting thing about it is that in almost invariably, you're the one who comes out second best. Yes. I know. Is this man dangerous? I would say potentially yes. And the condition itself is certainly associated with many instances of very severely criminal behavior, even to the extent of homicide. This perhaps isn't common, but it certainly has occurred. And what are the people we have seen? What do they think about him now? His pattern seems to be that uh, he'll use you for what he can get out of you.
after he's got all he can get out of you, well, he'll move over to somebody else. And that way, I, I don't know if he has any what you might call friends left, by the way he's been going on for the past three years. And personally, I feel that uh, this time, I just don't want any more to do with him. My own personal opinion of him is that uh, um, it's only a matter of time before he will be back in our hands. Until he accepts his limitations, and the, until psychiatry has its results, then we have to call it a medical problem and no longer a social problem. Well, if it is a medical problem, we're ill-equipped to handle it because we have no suitable institution to put him into. If we're going to restrain and treat psychopaths and other offenders whose basic problem is a disordered mind, what we need is a combination hospital and jail where the man can be isolated and kept away from society where he can't help getting into trouble, where he can be treated, if this is possible, but most importantly, where he can be studied so that we can prevent this happening in others.